the roots of conflict. This is exactly what created the Palestinian refugee problem. May not be what you think. They wanted to keep them as pawns, as a tool against Israel. The truth behind the Palestinian refugees. This is what the tragedy is. On today's 700 Club Interactive. Good morning and welcome to 700 Club Interactive. Today we're going to bring you the final installment of our series on Israel called Whose Land Is It? In 1967, the UN Security Council passed a resolution to the Palestinian refugee problem. And yet, nearly 40 years after that resolution, and 70 years after Israel declared statehood, there are still Palestinian refugees living in the Holy Land, and their numbers are growing. When the Jewish people declared independence in 1948, they offered their Arab neighbors an olive branch. We appeal, in the very midst of the onslaught launched against us now for months, to the Arab inhabitants of the State of Israel to preserve peace and participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship. About a tenth of Palestine's Arabs took them up on their offer. The rest declared war. The 160,000 Palestinian Arabs that chose to stay with their neighbors, the Palestinian Jews of 1948, they became full citizens of the reborn state of Israel. The 160,000 now became 1.2 million. They have full rights, equal opportunities, and today you would see them in the Knesset, as members of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, in the Supreme Court, and anywhere else in the Israeli society. But what happened to the others? The Arabs tell the story of the Palestinian Nakba, or catastrophe, in which the Jews expelled hundreds of thousands of Arabs by force. But the facts tell a very different story, one that started even before Israel became a state. Yes. The Arab exodus from Palestine began shortly after the UN's partition vote in 1947. Roughly 30,000 wealthy Arabs were the first to leave, choosing to wait out the war in neighboring countries. Then over the next few months, thousands of others followed suit. One month before the Jews declared independence, British troops evacuated the northern coastal city of Haifa. When the Jewish Haganah took control, the city's Arabs were ordered to flee, but not by the Jews. On the contrary, David Ben-Gurion sent one of his top cabinet members to convince them to stay. Golda Meir described the scene in her memoir. Hundreds drove across the border but some went to the seashore to wait for boats. Ben Gurion called me in and said, I want you to go to Haifa at once and see to it that the Arabs who remain there are treated properly. You must get it into their heads that they have nothing to fear. I sat there on the beach and I begged them to return to their homes. I talked myself blue in the face and it didn't help. They only had one answer. We know there is nothing to fear, but we have to go. We'll be back. The British police backed up Golda's account, saying, every effort is being made by the Jews to persuade the Arab populace to stay and carry on with their normal lives and to be assured that their lives and interests will be safe the city's British commander, Major General Hugh Stockwell, told the departing Arabs, You have made a foolish decision. You must accept the conditions of the Jews. They are fair enough. After all, it was you who began the fighting, and the Jews have won. In the end, more than 50,000 Arabs fled Haifa, turning the thriving port city into a ghost town. 
So if the British wanted them to stay, and the Jews wanted them to stay, who made the Arabs leave? The Arab populations, many of them, heeded the calls from the Arab leaders to attack their Jewish neighbors or to leave the area, kind of let it be cleared so the conquering, advancing Arab armies can just kill the Jews and drive them into the sea. This is exactly what created the Palestinian refugee problem. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Sayed announced that we will smash the country with our guns and obliterate every place the Jews seek shelter in. The Arabs should conduct their wives and children to safe areas until the fighting has died down. And in his memoir, Syrian Prime Minister Khalid al-Azam wrote that since 1948, we have been demanding the return of the refugees to their homes. But we ourselves are the ones who encourage them to leave. Only a few months separated our call to them to leave and our appeal to the United Nations to resolve on their return. By the time Israel declared statehood, more than 200,000 Arabs had left Palestine. As one refugee told a Jordanian newspaper, the Arab government told us, get out so that we can get in. We got out, but they did not get in. The UN partition plan had given both Jews and Arabs the chance to build their own states in Palestine. But instead of starting a country, the Arabs started a war they didn't win. And the result was even more refugees. In July of 1948, an order from the Israeli army stated that Arab villages were not to be looted or demolished. But as the war progressed, Arabs were expelled from places where they posed security risks. Cities like Ramle and Lod, where their forces regularly attacked Jewish convoys. But these cases were the exception, not the rule. And even the commander of Jordan's Arab Legion admitted that villages were frequently abandoned even before they were threatened by the progress of war. This is what has to be understood. The Palestinian refugee problem is first and foremost the responsibility of the Arab Palestinian leaders of the time in 1948, the leaders of the Arab League, and the leaders of the Arab nations who attacked Israel in 1948. By the end of the war in 1949, around 600,000 Arabs had left Palestine. But today, over 5 million people are registered as Palestinian refugees. Why do their numbers keep growing? And why aren't they getting help from their fellow Arabs who encourage them to leave their homes in the first place? The short answer is that they wanted to keep them as pawns, as a tool against Israel, and also to keep it always as a claim against Israel and as an incitement to educating their children to hate Israel, to look at Israel and the Jews as those who created this quote-unquote injustice to the Palestinians. The refugees should have been absorbed by their fellow Arabs in neighboring countries. At least that was the plan back in 1949 when the UN started the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA. But that plan fell apart when the Arab nations refused to take the Palestinians, even though they had been offered international funds to pay for them. Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon insisted they had no room. And when the Egyptians gained control of the Gaza Strip in 1949, they refused to allow Gaza's 200,000 Palestinians to move into Egypt or anywhere else. Lebanon and Saudi Arabia allowed some refugees to enter, but not to become citizens, hold jobs, or own land. The only exception was Jordan, which absorbed more than 2 million Palestinians. By international law, the refugees that are 
in any country have to be treated with dignity. They have to get services, they have to get uh, citizenship. This was not the case with the Arab refugees of Palestine or with the Arab countries. They, until today, 66 years later, are kept in subhuman conditions in refugee camps. We are honorable people. We are not looking to impose on anyone or to beg to receive charity. We are not used to this. We are used to working and feeding ourselves from our own labor and the sweat of our brow. I have a kid with special needs. How am I going to get him health care? How will we live in this country if I'm confined to this small camp? Tell me. They were denied uh, citizenship, social security, uh, health care, education, and they were put as a burden on the international community. Also, their children who were already born in these respective countries, whether it was in Lebanon or Syria or any other countries, also these children who by law should receive citizenship as they were born in these countries, were denied citizenship. The Yarmouk district in Damascus is the largest Palestinian camp in Syria. Today, it's on the front lines of the Syrian civil war. And since 2013, some 45,000 Palestinian refugees have fled to Lebanon, where they're also being confined to camps in subhuman conditions. There's no food, no vegetables, and no bread. If you get food, it's sometimes rotten. There is nothing in this camp. When we arrived here, we were 12 people living in this tent. I still don't have a tent for me and my closest, not even a mattress. This is the third Nakba that we have witnessed. The first time was when we had to leave Palestine. My family and I went to Lebanon, but the people there were picking on the Palestinians. Then we escaped to Syria and registered as refugees. This is the third time that disaster has befallen us and leaving us homeless. In the West Bank and Gaza, things aren't much better. Even though the Palestinian Authority has received 25 times more financial aid per capita than it took to rebuild post-war Europe under the Marshall Plan, today 1.8 million Palestinians live in the Gaza Strip and 1.5 million of them are registered refugees who take help from the United Nations. 98% of all Palestinians actually live under Palestinian rule, whether in Gaza or in uh, the Palestinian uh, Authority area in the West Bank. They still have refugee camps in the Palestinian-controlled areas as well, which is also something which is unbelievable, all the money that the international community gave to the Palestinians far um, surpasses any uh, contributions, any donations that any other people received throughout history. This money was not used to solve the Palestinian refugee problems. Unfortunately, it was used to rearm and uh, obtain terror uh, capabilities against Israel. The UN currently has two agencies that deal with refugees. The United Nations Refugee Agency, or UNHCR, deals with refugees from all over the world, while UNRWA handles only the Palestinians. So what's the difference between the two? UNHCR's website states that camp should be the exception and only a temporary measure for refugees. And its stated goals for refugees are voluntary repatriation, resettlement, and integration into the host countries. UNRWA, on the other hand, claims its mandate is merely to contribute to the human development of Palestine refugees until a durable and just solution is found. Everywhere else, Refugees lose their status after gaining citizenship from a recognized country. Palestinians, however, can be considered both refugees and citizens. As of 2015, UNHCR had a staff of 9,300 to handle refugees all over the world. While UNRWA had more than 30,000 employees on its payroll just for the Palestinians. To make matters worse, in 1982, 
UNRWA further extended refugee status to all future generations of displaced Palestinians, forever. There is no precedent in history that you can continue the refugee services the second, third, and we have here cases of fourth generation as well. So who's picking up the tab for all this? In 2014, the top 10 contributors included Europe, Saudi Arabia, and Japan. And at the very top of the list is the United States, which has contributed a total of $5 billion since UNRWA was founded. UNRWA refugees receive three times more aid than other non-Palestinian refugees around the world. And also, they have one unique criteria, which no other refugee in the world shares, and that is they can continue the status of refugees to their descendants. For seven decades, Arab leaders have pushed for a Palestinian right of return to Israel. But what you don't often hear is that the 1948 war created two sets of refugees, one Arab and one Jewish. In 1917, the British government issued the Balfour Declaration, which promised the Jews a national home in Palestine. The declaration stated that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. But after Israeli independence, all bets were off. Ancient Jewish communities throughout the Middle East were decimated. In Iraq, Zionism became a capital crime, and Jewish property was seized. Egypt, Syria, and Yemen were rocked by anti-Jewish pogroms, and the Syrian government froze Jewish bank accounts. Many of these communities were thousands of years old, and most of them disappeared almost overnight. There were about 850,000 Jewish refugees from Arab countries. Most of them were expelled or ran away for their lives to Israel. About 600,000 came here. About 200,000, 250,000 are in other uh, countries. They never had any compensations. They never had any restoration of their rights after their citizenship was stripped away from them. And why don't we hear about their Jewish refugee problem? Because Israel absorbed them from the get-go. They were treated as human beings. They were given citizenship, and today, you don't hear not about their status and not about, of course, their descendants, which are proud Israeli citizens. My father was a refugee from Algeria. He left Algeria penniless. He came here. He participated in the uh, War of uh, Independence. And of course, I'm very proud of him. Throughout the 20th century, tens of millions of refugees around the world have been successfully resettled. So why haven't the Palestinians done the same? Here's how one of UNRWA's own directors, Sir Alexander Galloway, answered that question in 1952. The Arab nations do not want to solve the refugee problem. They want to keep it as an open sore, as an affront to the United Nations, and as a weapon against Israel. Arab leaders do not give a damn whether Arab refugees live or die. What we have seen by successive Palestinian leaders for the last 100 years is that they were shortchanging their own people by not willing to compromise, by looking at the conflict as a zero-sum game, by trying to win it all and destroy Israel. Uh, this all-or-nothing approach leaves and will leave them with nothing. And this is what the tragedy is, that the Palestinians have not been able to produce leaders who would be strong enough, who would be courageous enough, who would be wise enough to really seek peace. We want to thank you for watching our three-part series. If you missed an installment or want to watch one again, you can go to CBN.com, and there you can stream the series or order the DVD. It's only $10.00. And you can also call us toll-free, 888-777-1999, and tell the person on the other end of the line that you want whose land 
is it? Only $10. Well, coming up, the anti-Semitic history behind the Israel Free Movement. Students are being fed a diet of Israel is a racist state, Israel equals the Nazis. Hear why the spirit of Nazism is alive and well across Europe. That's coming up next. One of the goals of the Nazis was to rid Germany of any trace of the Jews. They called it Judenfrei, or free of Jews. Now some warn the same anti-Semitic spirit has returned today in a different form. It's a drive to erase any sign of Israel from Europe. Dale Hurd has been looking into it. Across Europe, more cities and regions are trying to become Israel-free zones, free of the taint of what Israel critics call an apartheid state. In England, the Leicester City Council voted last year to boycott goods made in Israeli settlements in the West Bank. It's as if cities like Leicester want to cleanse themselves of Israeli impurity. And that reminds some of a very dark chapter in Europe's history. The Nazi drive to purify Germany of any trace of the Jews. The city of Leicester declined our request for an on-camera interview and issued this statement. Leicester City Council condemns anti-Semitism and all forms of racism and discrimination in the strongest possible terms. This is not a boycott of Israel by Leicester. The motion relates specifically to produce originating from illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. While Leicester City government doesn't think it's being anti-Semitic, Jeffrey Kaufman, the former head of Leicester's progressive Jewish community, disagrees. But the fact that the city council have chosen um, to, to pick on Israel exclusively, in, in my view, makes it uh, anti-Semitic because the city council have exclusively dealt with the uh, Palestinian-Israel situation to the exclusion of any other international events uh, that are happening at the moment or any other countries. Other cities across Europe have gone further than Leicester. Last summer, during the Gaza conflict, the Irish town of Kinvara went completely Israel-free. No Israeli products in stores or restaurants. It's part of a movement called BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions. Five, six, seven, eight. And it's all aimed at Israel. Israeli musicians and actors have had their performances disrupted, like this event at London's Globe Theatre. This London Ahava cosmetics store was picketed until it finally closed down. Ahava is an Israeli company, but the BDS forces will boycott any company that has dealings with Israel. The Israel boycott movement says it's not anti-Semitic, but they don't boycott any other nations. Israel is a democracy. There are plenty of cruel dictatorships around the world they could boycott, but they don't. No other country, just Israel. Richard Millett tracks the BDS movement through his website. They won't be calling for boycotts of America who they don't agree with, or Britain, British government policy that they don't agree with, before we get into China, Russia, Syria, Saudi Arabia. There is no boycott, Dale, so you, you answer why. We support the Antifada! The BDS movement is taking over college campuses in Europe and America. Ronnie Fraser is a college lecturer and founding director of the Academic Friends of Israel. He warns that the next generation of leaders is being brainwashed, that Israel is the worst nation on earth. Students are being fed a diet of Israel is a racist state, Israel is a Zionist state, Israel equals the Nazis. Fraser sued his own union for institutional anti-Semitism for promoting an academic boycott of Israel. Their agenda is delegitimization of the state of Israel, destruction of Israel, get rid of Israel. While the Israel boycott movement says it's not anti-Semitic, according to the definition set down by the European Union, it is. The EU says anti-Semitism can include denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor and by applying double standards to Israel. It should probably not be surprising that more Britons now dislike Israel than Iran, and that new polling shows that more than half of British Jews say they have no future in the UK, and one in four have thought about leaving. Jonathan Sasserdati is with the campaign against anti-Semitism that conducted the polling. He says it reveals that British Jews are beginning to feel unwelcome. 
We asked in our survey, uh, in the past two years, I have witnessed or experienced more anti-Semitism than in previous years. We were asking the Jewish respondents if that was the case. And 56% agreed that they had seen more in the past two years. When you see a Jewish-owned shop, whether it be Israeli or not, it's still a Jewish-owned shop. When you see it targeted for boycotting and violence against the, the store itself, you can't not help think that this is exactly what happened in Nazi Germany, that they were boycotting Jewish-owned shops. In Germany, Nazi persecution of the Jews also began with a boycott in April 1933. Some of those boycotting Israel may truly feel that they're only trying to help Palestinians. But to Jews, the goal of the BDS movement is a destination similar to Nazi Germany. Mandy Blumenthal is with the campaign against anti-Semitism. People want to see the total destruction of Israel. When people say from the river to the sea, that's what it means. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The Nazis would call it Judenfrei, free of Jews. Dale heard CBN News reporting from Leicester and London. Dale, thank you for that report. It's a great reminder to pray for all parties involved in this situation. Thank you for joining us today. We want to leave you with these words from Psalm 25, verse 22. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. Also want to take a moment to remind you, if you need prayer in your life, it's our privilege to pray with you. You can give us a call, 888-777-1999. Whatever's on your heart, whatever burdens are weighing you down, we'd like to journey with you through that. Give us a call at our toll-free number and someone is available to pray for you. Thanks for joining us on 700 Club Interactive. Until next time, I'm Andrew Knox. Bye-bye.